So the process of muscle contraction is regulated in a very complicated way. But we can see this regulation break down by considering what happens after death. That's physiologically, not philosophically. Shortly after death, the body experiences a condition known as rigor mortis, which is when muscles stiffen and partially contract. You can see this pretty clearly in the flexors of the hand in the upper right hand corner, or really severely in the case down in the bottom right. It looks like that person is laying on a table because they're completely flat, but actually their shoulders and their feet are on chairs and their entire torso is unsupported. I wish that I had that kind of core strength um, while I'm living, but unfortunately I don't. A few things can create rigor mortis. The first thing is that the body stops producing ATP after death. So based upon what we just reviewed in our last video, that means that cross bridges between myosin and actin can't be broken. So essentially your skeletal muscle gets frozen in whatever state of partial contraction that it was in. But we also know that ATP is important for active transport and for maintaining concentration gradients. Without ATP being produced, those concentration gradients break down, resting membrane potential depolarizes, and the calcium that's normally compartmentalized inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum gets released into the cytosol. And so that allows new cross bridges to form as well. Rigor mortis sets in pretty quickly after death, and it generally lasts somewhere between 18 to about 36 hours, depending on the conditions. And it doesn't end because the body all of a sudden starts producing ATP or the calcium goes back to being compartmentalized. It ends because the tissues start to break down and the actin and the myosin starts to get degraded and that breaks the bonds. This is why rigor mortis has become sort of useful to forensic scientists and to medical examiners. You can assess the state of rigor mortis that a body is in and you can determine how long a person has been dead. So the image in the bottom left was taken from the body farm at the University of Tennessee, which is where they placed dead bodies in all sorts of environmental conditions and they studied the time course of rigor mortis. They're essentially trying to account for every possible scenario that a medical examiner could encounter at a crime scene and give them a standard to compare it to. And I just think that's completely awesome um, in the least sociopathic, murderous way possible. It's just a very cool concept that that exists, especially for people that are interested in forensics. So now that we've established how muscle contracts at a molecular level and how critical calcium is to that process, I know the question that you're all dying to have answered is how do we get that calcium signal? It turns out that our friends in the meat industry can help us to answer that question. So refrigeration was undoubtedly a huge technological advancement because it allowed us to preserve food for long periods of time and to prevent spoilage. And this was especially important for the meat industry. But one of the early problems that the meat industry ran into when refrigerating meat was cold shortening. Remember I mentioned earlier that muscles play a role in thermoregulation. So skeletal muscle contracts when it's cold to generate heat for the body. But this also means that when you refrigerate a nice tender slab of meat, it contracts in that cold temperature and essentially turns it into a hockey puck that many people found to be unpalatable. So the meat industry actually solved this problem by figuring out that if they electrocute the carcasses repeatedly at high voltages, which is what you're seeing in the pictures here, you can completely deplete the muscle fibers of calcium and that prevents the process of cold shortening from happening. So it's become standard practice in the meat industry. Yummy, right? Did I mention that I'm a vegetarian? But thinking about cold shortening uh, and the solution that they came up with gives us our missing link. The calcium that's required for muscle contraction is released by electricity. In other words, in order to release calcium, the muscle fiber needs to fire an action potential. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any guys walking around in white coats with electrodes inside of our muscles, but we do have neurons that synapse with skeletal muscle. When those efferent motor neurons fire their action potentials, they release neurotransmitter that stimulates skeletal muscle fibers to fire their action potential. And that's what initiates the process of contraction. In the previous unit, we talked about synapses between pre and postsynaptic neurons. 
But here at this synapse, we have an alpha motor neuron and a skeletal muscle fiber. And this synapse is called the neuromuscular junction, or NMJ. Our presynaptic cell is a neuron, and our postsynaptic cell is a muscle fiber. Every single skeletal muscle fiber is innervated by the axon terminal of a motor neuron. Now, one of the things that I didn't emphasize before, but I'm going to now, is that most neurons have multiple axon terminals. So this means that a single motor neuron can actually synapse with many muscle fibers. So a single motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that are under its control is referred to as a motor unit. And for the reasons that we talked about back in the neurophysiology unit, when a motor neuron fires its action potential, all of the axon terminals will depolarize at the exact same time and release neurotransmitter at the exact same time. This is known as the all or nothing principle. And it's important here because it means that under normal circumstances, whenever a motor neuron fires the action potential, all of the muscle fibers under its control will also fire their action potentials as well. The entire motor unit responds as a unit. 